Today's date is December 10th, 1996. The survivor is Rachel L. Gottstein. Landau is the maiden name. Renee Firestone is the interviewer. We're in San Mateo, United States of America. The language of the interview is English. California. It is December 10th, 1996. My name is Renee Firestone, R-E-N-E-F-I-R-E-S-T-O-N-E. -E -E. And I want to thank Rachel Gutstein for permitting us to take her uh, interview today. Her maiden name is Landau. We are in San Mateo, California in the United States, and we will speak English. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing us to take your testimony. Uh, let's begin with uh, uh, s uh, telling your full name, your maiden name, and spell uh, the names for us. Okay. My name is Rachel Landau Gottstein, and I spell Rachel R-A-C-H-E-L, Landau L-A-N-D-A-U, Gottstein, G-O-T-T-S-T-E-I-N. Uh, when were you born and where? I was born September 8, 1936, in Krakow, Poland. That makes you how old today? It makes me 60 years old. And uh, that's what I think I was born, because I don't have a birth certificate and I don't have anybody that knows exactly when I was born. Were you raised in Poland? Yes, yes. Where? Well, it started out in Krakow, and then when bad things started happening to Jewish people, my parents uh, decided to go and uh, move to a town called Skavina, because my grandfather who was also a rabbi, not a practicing rabbi, but he had smicha, which is the ordinance to be a rabbi, was also the mayor of the town of Skavina, which is very unusual that a Jew should be in those years in politics. But for some reason he was. And so my parents thought that they'll be safe because he was on such a high position. Tell me a little bit about uh, the time when you lived in Krakow. Uh, what did your father do for a living? What was his name? What do you remember of him? Um, I remember very little of Krakow. I just know that I always saw a lot of people coming to our home. And I remember always guests and people and a lot of talk. It was as though people were coming for advice, it seemed to me. And um, my uh, other grandfather also lived in Krakow. And my father's, uh, br all his brothers and sisters, and my mother's brothers and sisters, and uh, my father's name was Arye Yehuda Leib, and they called him in Polish Leon. And my mother's name was Miriam, and they called her Mania. What did your father do for a living? Um, I know that my parents and my grandparents, uh, it was a family business. They had two businesses that I always used to hear something to do with tires, where they manufacture tires, because then I heard afterwards that the Germans took away these companies from my pa family because they were making tires for tanks from with, with the machines that my parents used for their uh, civilian tires, and that they also had something to do with wood. Uh, I don't know exactly what, but not a carpentry, but a, a big company where they were getting woods from the wood and doing something with this wood. 
How do you remember your father? I remember him not anymore from Krakow because I think I was very little. But I remember when we lived in Skavina. I remember him as a very gentle person, very kind and very soft-spoken. Did you do a lot of things together? Um, I just remember that uh, he used to take me sometimes what I think was where he worked. And in Skavina, I remember it was also their company, my family's company, because when he took me there, I saw there my grandfather and I saw there my other uncle, my father's brother. And that has to, had to do with cement. And I remember that. I asked him once, what do you do with all these stones? And, all? and we went walking, and in the road there was water running down a side of the road, and it had a, a circle, a cement, you know, circle. And he said, this is what we do. We do so that the road shouldn't get flooded and the water runs through the cement. I don't know why I remember that. That I remember. How do you remember your mother? I remember my mother is a very... I don't know why I remember her like that, but I remember her as a very strong person. And sometimes even I felt... How come a, a, a lady is strong and a man is so soft? And I used to think that when I was little. I looking back, I remember thinking that she was very strong and, and a lot of people later after the war told me, did you know anything about your mother? And I sa said, no. Sorry. So I said, no, I don't remember too much about my mother, but I remember one thing that one time I uh, wanted to give her a present when I was very little. And I didn't know what to give her. So I went to my neighbor's garden and I saw beautiful green and I pulled it out and then on the bottom were these long red orange things you know it turned out to be carrots but at that time I didn't I guess I was too young to know and I didn't even know that what it was and I brought it to my mother and she said where did you get this and I said, oh, I brought you this beautiful present because I want you to have it. And she said, where did you get this? And I said, I took it from my neighbor's garden. And she said, this is called stealing, and you should never do that. And I said, but nobody saw. And she said, God saw. And I always want you to behave in such a way that you should always think, even when you're all alone, that God is always there and he sees everything for the good and for the bad. And at the time, it was a terrible thing because she made me go back with these carrots to the neighbor and she came with me and she made me apologize to the neighbor and tell her that I did it. But in the long run, it was a wonderful thing because through all the years that I was alone in the camps and in the worst periods, 
I always felt I'm not alone because God is always there with me. So that's one part of my mother. And another part is that people told me that she was extremely, extremely smart and wise woman and that all of the people in Skavina considered her very, very smart. How old were you when you took the parents? Uh, I must have been maybe four years old. And do you know how old you were when they moved to Skavina? Maybe three. So you went to school in Skavina? No, I didn't. No, I didn't go to school. The first time I went to school was after the concentration camp, when I was liberated. Um, but I, I wanted to go to school, and how I know that is because in Skavina, passing our house somewhere in one direction was a school, and a lot of young men, which at the time they seemed to me like very grown up, but now I think maybe they were 16 or 17. They were always walking with notebooks and, and a lot of pens and pencils, and I used to watch them from the entrance of our house. And one day I just took my father's pencil and I saw a notebook and I took it and I didn't tell them and I ran after these boys and I went after them and I came right where they were going and I sat down someplace in, in a chair in the back of the room where they all were and then and I took it so seriously that here I succeeded in doing something so important and uh, they all turned around and suddenly they started all laughing and then the teacher came and took me and all I remember is that I was crying and then my mother came and took me and she said, you should never, never, never run away again. So that was my experience of school in, in Skavina, but that's all. How old were you then? I think I was still four or five. Did you have any friends in Skavina? No, but I had, uh, there was a nanny that, that every day took me in the afternoon and she took me for walks and she took me wherever she, she took care of me. And wherever she met other people, she took me in the carriage, the stroller. So the other nanny's children, I was, you know, that was who I talked to, but no, I just had cousins. That those were my friends, my cousins. Did you have any siblings later? No, I never had any, because my parents were young when uh, they were killed, so I didn't. How far back do you remember? As far back as what I'm telling you now. What, what were you doing during the day in Skavina? I don't remember very much. I just remember being at home in the morning and my mother being busy with her father. He, we all lived together in a house and uh, my father going to work and sometimes my mother going with me to pick him up. In the afternoon, this nanny coming and taking me and bringing back and just my mother teaching me uh, Kriyat Shema, which is a prayer that you say before you go to sleep, and I don't remember very much. Do you remember your grandparents? Not very much, no. Were your uh, parents religious? Yes, my parents were religious. How religious were they? I would say modern orthodox, which I am too now, modern orthodox. Do you remember any of the rituals that were going on in the house? I just remember my father putting on uh, the tallit and uh, tefillin in the morning, which is the prayer uh, paraphernalia, you know, that uh, religious Jewish men pray with. 
and uh, I, it must have been already very bad times, because if I was born in 36, so what I remember was already probably 39 or 40, and so times were bad, so I don't even think that they went to synagogue. I think everything was done quietly at home. Do you recall Friday nights or Shabbat? No, I don't. Any of the holidays spending with your parents? No. That's why I think that it's possible that I was born later than 36. Because uh, the way I remember things, it's not possible that I wouldn't remember at the age of four a Friday meal or a Saturday meal in a religious home, but I don't. What is it you remember about the home itself? I remember that it was a two-story home. It was a big home. It was a house. And I remember the grandparents living there. And I remember my parents. That's about all I remember. When did you leave this house? At one point, uh, my parents heard that uh, all the Jews of the town were being rounded up. And they took me to a neighbor. And they took me to this neighbor, and the neighbor took me and put me in the basement. And my parents said, you have to stay here and we'll see you as soon as we can. And they went away, and the neighbor closed the light, and she said, I have to keep you here quiet, because otherwise the Nazis are searching for the Jews, and if they'll find you, they'll take you also. And your parents want me to, to hide you here. And I started screaming and crying, and I remember that I was just totally devastated. I couldn't understand what does that mean? They're going to leave me here. And I was just screaming and screaming and screaming. And the neighbor said, I'm taking you to an uncle of yours, and we're going to Vielichka. And I said, what is Vielichka? And she said, that's a town, another town. That's where he lives. And I remember that um, she took me and she put a big hat on me, a big straw hat. And I said, I don't want to wear that hat. And she said, you have to, because otherwise they'll see that you are Jewish. And we walked, and then she saw some soldiers and she said, we're going to go into the church, and we're going to sit there, and we're going to kneel, and I'm going to pray, and you are going to pray with me. And we, I'm going to show you how to cross yourself, and we're going to pray. And I said, I'm not going to go into the church. I'm not going to cross myself, and I'm not going to kneel. And she said, you have to. And I said, no. My mother and my father told me that I'm not allowed to cross myself, and I'm not allowed to kneel because I'm Jewish, and that I always have to remember that I'm Jewish. And she said, well, you just come and you just sit next to me. So we went to this church, and I remember a cross, and I remember the picture, you know, of Jesus and Mary and everything. And I wanted to listen to my parents, you know, and. So I didn't look at the cross, and I didn't look at the picture of Jesus and Mary, because, you know, as a child, I, I thought, my goodness, maybe that will change me, and I won't be Jewish anymore if I look. So I didn't look, and then, then she took me. And then we arrived somehow, and I don't remember how, to this place called Vielichka. And there lived my uncle who was married to the sister of my father and who had uh, Hungarian papers. And it seems that Polish Jews 
who had Hungarian papers were not taken to the concentration camps as soon as the Polish Jews. So when I came to this uncle's house, he said, I am going to put you also in a basement because I have to hide you because they know that we are the Hungarian Jews, but you, they don't know about you. So don't be afraid because down there are other people. So he picked up a carpet and there was a trap door and steps and I went down there and there were maybe nine or ten other people and we stayed there every day, all day and uh, in the evening they would take us out either we would walk in the garden for fresh air or we would sit in my uncle's home in the apartment or it was a home but in his living room and there I remember there was Friday night he used to make kiddush and I uh, used to have challah and wine and and quietly they would sing Zmirot which is you know the songs they sing on Shabbat and he had a daughter and she was a year younger than myself or maybe two years younger than myself and then he had a brother and his brother's child that was uh, my age or maybe a year younger and we were and then there was a little boy there also another brother's child and he was two years old and so there we were all nice children you know and adults and I, it felt good because at least I felt I'm with people that are family How long after your parents left you with the neighbor did this happen? A day. They, the neighbor didn't keep me more than a day. And did you know what happened to your parents? At the time I didn't know, but uh, I heard that the Jewish people that were taken from Skavina were taken somewhere and they were um, all, uh, some people told me that they thought maybe in Poishau they killed all of them or maybe on the way to Poishau that they killed them many people that didn't die because they, the, the Nazis didn't want to use so much ammunition and so to save ammunition they would kill some and and some other people, they would just push into this big hole, and then they would pour kerosene and burn everybody. And, and that's what I heard. But I heard that many years later, after the war. When you were with your family, did you ask about your parents? All the time, all the time. I said, when can I go home? and where is my mother and where is my father and my uncle always said uh, don't worry soon you'll see them soon don't worry do you know today whether they knew then your uncle uh, did they know what happened to you I'm I think they must have known I think because a lot of things were known and a lot of things people that ran away from places were telling other Jewish people, you know, we ran away and the Nazis came and they kicked in doors and they pulled out the people and these ones were killed and these ones were burned and these ones were uh, all these terrible things that happened. So how long were you in this house with your relatives? I think probably over six months I think because it was a long time because I remember that my uncle had sisters he had a lot of people in this house my uncle his name was Mordechai Katz Max they called him and he was uh, taken to Buchenwald and to a lot of other camps but he ended up in Buchenwald 
and he was a great, great uh, tzaddik. I mean, the, he was a very righteous man because he hid a lot of people in his house and, and he helped so many people. I remember whoever came, he took them in. He did never ever say, I have no room, or I have no food, or I have no money. And so I think why I think it was a long time that I was there is because he had sisters, and these sisters took it upon themselves to teach us little children how to tell time. And it was the hardest thing because, the, you know, it was by, by numbers. It wasn't these digital clocks. And this was the big event that we had to learn how to tell time. And I remember I used to always hide in the bathroom not to have to all the time learn this time. And so I finally, when I left Vielichka, I knew how to tell time. So it must have been a long time that I was there. But also because a lot of things happened there. A lot of people came, a lot of people went, and so it seemed like maybe it was six months. And where did you go from Vyarichka? Well, one night when we were out in the, back, in the backyard in the garden, the neighbors ran to the Gestapo and told them that my uncle is hiding Jews in his house. And the Gestapo came, and they kicked in the doors, and it was evening, so we all were out of the, of the basement. We were up in the living room, and they came and they rounded everybody up. But there was an outhouse in this garden, so I took the two little girls and me, the little boy, no, because he was only two, and I ran with them into the outhouse. And when I, when we ran, I thought, I don't know how long we'll have to be in this outhouse. So I grabbed with me some bread. So we were in this outhouse, these three children. And my cousin said, I'm hungry after a, a, a long time. And I said, you cannot be hungry because you cannot eat without saying hamotzi on this bread and you're not allowed to say it in the toilet. So I cannot let you out till I'm sure that there's no more Nazis around. So we stayed there, and then the two little girls started crying. So I said, OK, we'll go out. So we went out of the outhouse, and we went into the house. And it was dark, and there was nobody there. But meanwhile, the mother of this little boy, she hid him under blankets. And under the blankets, I found him. It wasn't blankets. It was, you know what a piagina is? It's like a down. And he, she covered him so that the Nazis shouldn't take him. So now I was in charge. I was maybe six years old. And I was in charge of this little boy of a little girl that was my age, maybe a little younger, and a little girl that was maybe four years old. We have to stop for a minute to change tapes now. You told me you were left with these children. Did any of the adults come back? So we, we were the four children, and we were just sitting there and scared and crying. And a while later, but it was a long time later, the mother of the sister of my father, the mother of my little cousin, she came back and she said, everybody quiet. We are going someplace now, but we're going to be again in hiding and you have to be very, very quiet. So she took all of us, she taped the mouth of the little boy and we went to somebody's house. And this was an apartment. And there was a big a wooden bookcase. And it wasn't built in. It was away from a wall. So um, we, there was a space. 
and she told us all to go behind that bookcase and stand there and sit there or stand there, whatever, but be very quiet. And behind this bookcase was the other end, the mother of the little boy. So it was the mother of the girl and the mother of the boy, but me and one other girl had no mother there. And we were there and nobody else was there from all these people that that uh, were from the house, just us were there. And then we heard banging and the doors were closed so the Nazis kicked them in and they came and said to this woman, you are hiding Jews, you are going to get be killed. And they pulled her and I don't know where they took her and they took all of us to the Gestapo station in the city of um, Vialichka. And good or bad, I don't know, but I was the type of child that always liked to be liked by everybody. And I always tried to uh, be so nice and smile and do everything that people wanted so that they should like me. And so I started smiling at these Nazis and, and saying, oh, you have such a nice clothes, or I like your shoes, or, and they said, you keep quiet, you Jew. And I couldn't understand, you know, why? Why don't they like me? And uh, they said, if you tell us where all these people that were with you in the house, where did they run, where did they go, we will let you go and then you can go back to your house and you can play. And I didn't know where they went, you know, but I just wanted so much for them to let us go. So I said, oh, I saw over there. They all went over there. And they said, really, you saw them running over there? And I said, yes, all of them were running over there. And it's not true, you know, because I didn't see anybody running. Because all the people that were taken to this woman's house behind the bookcase, we were all there together. So I remember they took each adult to another room and we heard hitting. I heard, you know, when you give somebody a, you hit them in the face. We heard that and I heard screaming and crying and everything. And we, we started crying and the Nazis kept saying, quiet, quiet. And uh, even though I was little, I knew that this was not going to be good, that this is something that's going to be very, very bad. And I think that was the turning point in my childhood that I realized that nobody is here that is going to make it nice. Now it's probably going to be not so nice. But how not nice, I couldn't even imagine. What happened then? So um, then from there, they took us by a, a truck and they drove us to a place called Ode in Krakow. And I don't know exactly what it was because, you know, I never spoke about this. Only once before was I interviewed uh, and once I spoke in a university. But I never asked other people about what do they know or what, what Ode is or what it isn't. I always try to deny that all this happened. So I don't know what Ode was really. But I know that it was a place surrounded with barbed wire. There were a lot of Nazis. And uh, there were only women there, no men, women and children. And I remember that we were put in some big hall or room and they, the beds were like bunk beds. And I also remember that every day they took many, many people, 
and they took them on a truck and the people didn't want to go because it was a known fact that they were going to go someplace where they were going to get killed. And I remember many days where we were being told to stand in line and they called it appel. They called uh, numbers, this number and that. We, they didn't call us anymore by names, they called us by numbers. And um, I remember they would then take a whole large group of people and push them into these trucks. And I remember a, a woman, she was probably my, my age, she probably was 60 years old, and she was running and screaming and crying and saying, please take somebody else, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And she ran and ran and ran. And I remember she came around us and she said, maybe somebody else wants to go because I don't want to go, I want to live. And I remember I was thinking, why doesn't she want to go? She's so old. She probably is going to die anyway soon. So maybe she should go and let us, the young people, stay. How little did I realize that I'm now this age and I don't want to die. So I can very much sympathize with her, but at that time I couldn't understand why she wanted to put all of us in danger because every time somebody resisted they would take 10 other people in addition and w it was such a horrible thing to see how people would run down the, the trucks and the Nazis would push them on the trucks and they would run down of the trucks and screaming and crying and many times they were shooting because people started running there was not very far to run because there was a barbed wire, but still they were running where as far as they could. You know, that's the first time I saw shooting where another one person killed another person. I was just, I couldn't understand how is that possible, you know, and And I remember I said to my cousin, I said, do you think that my mother was telling me the truth when she told me a long time ago? I said, do you think that my mother was telling me the truth, that God really is everywhere? <laughs> and my cousin said, well, if he is everywhere, she took her hands and she made like a growling sound. She looked up and she said, God, if you are there, I really hate you. And, uh, and I, I said, no, you mustn't make him angry because then maybe something even worse is going to happen. And if you're going to be nice to God, then maybe something nice is going to happen to us. So I said to her, you know what? Why don't we say Shema Israel? Because my parents taught me to say that and, and maybe that is going to help. And so I said to the little children, you know, the four of us, the little boy, no, because my aunt was holding him in her arms. And I said, let's say Shema Israel. So we all said that, you know, 
which is the prayer that we say. And then again, we went back to the to the, our banks, and every morning was the same ritual. Every morning they would the same thing, take people out, and and every day they would bring people in. And so many people were coming, and so many people were going. And then I remember one day I got very, very sick. And I didn't know what the, what I had, but I heard everybody saying she had she has scarlet fever. And in Polish they were saying scarlatina. She has scarlatina. And the other people said, we don't want her in this bunk because she's going to infect all of us. And my aunt said, you know, we have to keep her in the bunk. You know, where can we put her? Because this is the only place for us to be. And they said, no, she should be outside. And my aunt was begging them not to put me outside. And they said, if you don't let us put her outside, we'll put all of you outside, you and all your other children, too. And uh, it wasn't the Nazis now. It was the other inmates. And they put me outside. And I remember I was outdoors on a bench. And it must have been winter, because I remember it was freezing cold. And I even remember ice. I remember I touched my hair and I felt ice. And then they t I remember my aunt took me in. And if he, I don't know how fast or how slow, but apparently I got better because I was back to myself, back to again being the little boss over my cousins. I always used to kind of be in charge, even though my aunt was in charge. There were two aunts. The, the mother of the little boy, she was a wife of a brother of my uncle, the one that took us in, in Vialichka. And she was the daughter of a very great rabbi in Poland. So I remember uh, the day came when it was our turn to go on the trucks. And uh, we kissed each other, even though we all went together, because my aunt said, don't be afraid, but just let's say goodbye now before we get on the truck. And they never took more. Uh, usually every day they took maybe 40 people on these trucks. And this particular day they only took my two aunts and the four children, that was all. And they took us to a place called um, um, Poishau. And in Poishau, that was a big camp, but it was a place in Poishau called the Grey House. And the Grey House was called the Grey House because they would take people there, they would torture them, and they would kill them. And they took us to this gray house. And uh, I could see that my two aunts were hysterically crying. They probably knew what the gray house meant from how, I don't know, but I never saw them so, so hysterical. And they were clutching each one her child, and they were crying and everything. So we came to this gray house, and the Nazis were yelling. The Gestapo was yelling, you know, you, you know, dirty Jew, and go in, and you will see what will happen to you. And we went into a very big room. It was in a cellar. The windows were covered with wood, and there were, uh, how do you call it? They were, you know, like in jail. There were grates on the windows. And there were already many people in this big room. In the room, there was a bucket, and that was the toilet. 
there was another bucket, there was water. And once a day, one of the Gestapo would come and bring bread to the people. And there there were men and women. And some of the people were not very nice that were there. And some of the people were very nice. There was a woman there, and she was a blonde woman with a blonde girl with blue eyes. And every day she kept saying to this little girl, you are not Jewish, and I'm not Jewish, and we are going to be let go from here. We don't belong with these people. Don't cry, don't worry. And every day they would pray, and they would cross themselves, and they would say, we don't know why we are here. And every day when the Nazis would come, they would say, are you going to admit that you are Jewish? And she said, no, I'm not Jewish. And they would start beating her. And they, they every day the same. And one day they said to her, if you are not going to admit tomorrow that you are Jewish, we are going to start beating your child. And this child was little, like us. And she said, I'm not going to admit, but please don't beat my child. If you want me to say I'm Jewish so that you shouldn't beat my child, I'll say I'm Jewish, but I'm not Jewish. And so the next day they came and they took them out. And outside there were cells. And the cell would be such that there was only room for you to stand. You couldn't sit, you couldn't bend, you couldn't move. And the cell had a little hole, and you could see through that hole. And they took this woman out. I don't know where they put her. I don't know if they put her in those cells. But they closed the door to our that, that big place where we were. And we would he and we heard screaming, hitting, yelling, pleading from this woman, please don't kill my child, please don't kill my child. And it for the longest time we heard the most horrible, horrible un like animals screaming from this woman and this child. And this place um it was a, a horrible nightmare because we th there was a, a bunk, one on the bottom, one on top, and everybody lay there together. And I remember there was a man there. I don't know what he was, who he was. He was always pulling my hair. He was always pulling, pulling my my. Uh, the clothes that I had, which were no clothes, you know, they took our clothes. It was just like a, a one dress and some kind of a pair of shoes without socks. And he was always pulling me. And I, my aunt would sleep, the first one, next to her was her daughter, then was my second aunt, next to her was her baby, then was my cousin, the one that was without a mother, and then I was and this man was next to me. So I always remember I would climb over my cousin, climb over the baby, and climb next to my aunt. And every time my aunt woke up, she says, what are you doing here? Go back to your place, you know? And I said, I can't go back to my place because this man is annoying us, annoying me. And she said, uh, he's not annoying you, just, you know, sleep, try to sleep. Hindsight, I can imagine how these two aunts, who were themselves young, maybe in their 20s, had their own children, had now two other children, and had to take care of all of us, didn't know what will be here, and had to cope with all of this. So they didn't have very much patience. And one, one day I remember they came and they opened the door and they said, today is a special day we put some fire outside in a stove and you can all warm up your bread on the stove and you can all wash the the underwear that you have in the water outside as a faucet 
and maybe you can keep it drying by this stove. So we, everybody went out, except the children we stayed. And I remember this crazy man, he stayed there too. And, and he was trying to scare us, so he said, ooh, ooh, you know, and he was turning around in circles and making all these strange noises. And then when my aunt came back, and she brought us this, this bread that was toasted or not, you know, just warmed up. We all said, you know, this man is annoying us. And my aunt said, I, I don't want to hear about this. We have so much to worry about. Don't even talk. And then a few days later, they took some people out. And every day they took more people out and more people out. And we used to hear these screamings outside all the time the same thing and one day the door opened and a Nazi came in and he was screaming he said you dirty Jews and he said to the other Nazi that was by the door he said close this door and go away I don't want anybody here because I'm going to just take care of these dirty Jews here and we all hugged my aunt, you know, and we shook and, and they closed, closed the door on a key from the outside. And there was like a hole in the door that when the Nazis came in, before they opened, they could look to see what we were doing. So this Nazi that screamed and yelled and he said, you know, wait till you see what I'm going to do with you. He closed that. He put some, uh, I don't know, a, 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 a tissue, a handkerchief or something. And as soon as he closed it, he came over to my aunt and he said to her in German, don't be afraid. I will come every day and I will bring you eggs and I will bring you butter and I will bring you sugar and I will bring you some milk and you will feed these children but don't say anything to anybody and don't ask any questions. And he gave us, he gave her this milk and he, and he came with a big, big German shepherd. And when he, they walked in, we all thought that he's going to have this German shepherd eat us up or something. But he said to this German shepherd, sit in German. And I, I will not forget because this, this was Maybe, I don't know, the only good person that I met throughout the whole years in the concentration camp. And I will never forget his name. His name was Carl. And he said, my name is Carl, but everybody calls me Carly. Who was he? He was a Nazi. He was a German. And we don't know why, but he came almost every day or sometimes when he couldn't, maybe once a week. And that helped us to survive with, he would sometimes bring eggs, sometimes butter, sometimes both, sometimes sugar. We don't know to this day who he is and why, but he, all the time we were there, he did that. He was so good to us. Was he a god? He was a, a, a SS because when sometimes they would make us march outside and he would be one of those that would be screaming and yelling and saying dirty Jews and we're going to kill you and terrible things. And yet when he would come into us, we don't know. To this day, I don't understand why. Did you try afterwards finding out who he was? I was? Yes, I tried. Not only did I try, but Carly in Hebrew means cold. I am cold. So in his honor, there was once, um, um, they wanted to name an ice cream in Israel. When I lived in Israel after the war, 
they wanted to name the ice cream and they put out a contest whoever will name the appropriate name will win a prize and the ice cream will be called by that name and I sent the name Carly and I won and it was this ice cream for many many years there was an ice cream on a stick in Israel called Carly but I didn't tell anybody that this is after a Gestapo that I called this ice cream do you remember in Plashov on the bunks where you slept did you have any blankets I think there were blankets there were gray blankets and do you remember what they fed you with what they fed us they fed us bread and they fed us a soup it was like water and sometimes there was a potato in it I don't remember anything else were you the children living with the adults Yes, we, the four of us, we lived with the adults all the time. And the adults had to go to the bathroom. And everything was done in front of everybody else. And sometimes they, they would put some of these blankets kind of around. You know, people would stand to give other people privacy. But uh, that was all there was, the only privacy. And every once in a while, they would come and they would take people out like that time for to warming up that bread and to wash their underwear but uh, most of the time it was for marching outside for getting beaten up I remember also a few times they took us out from there from the gray house and they brought us into the camp itself to a big place where there were showers and there were hundreds and hundreds of people and all the women went into the showers and we got uh, a chance to take these showers and then to go back to this gray house. Did they also beat the children? They beat this little girl of this woman Yes, because I heard her screaming, and I, I think they killed her, because the screaming was for a very long time. First it was quiet screaming, louder screaming, then horrible screaming, then screaming of somebody that's being tortured, and then less screaming and less screaming and no screaming. You'll stop again for a minute. You were telling me about the beating of this little girl and did she ever return to the gray house? No, she never returned neither did her mother ever return and I believe that she was killed right there downstairs in this cellar where they were beating them and uh, trying to, co to convince her that she should admit that they're Jewish You think today that she was killed but when you were still in the gray house at the age of six or seven how old were you then i i probably was six what did you think then i thought that they killed her because i already was surrounded by the knowledge of killing and i knew already that what they're doing is killing and i i knew that they torture and they kill and they beat and so I, I figured if she's not talking or screaming or coming back then she's killed what because I want to tell you the the upstairs of the gray house was the commando the the offices the headquarters of the Gestapo that ruled over Poishau and the gray house was kind of their the pet playhouse they used to take people there that they could do bad things to uh, worse than what they were doing to the people in the camps or maybe I shouldn't say worse because they did terrible things to everybody but 
a lot of people in that gray house did not come out alive, and that's why it had the reputation of the gray house. And in Polish, they called it Shari Domek, the gray house. You remember how many children were down there? Only the four of us, and when we arrived, this one little girl. What do you think is going to happen to you? How I, I was very, very scared because I only heard terrible things. And we couldn't even look outside. There was not even a window. The windows were barricaded by wood. And there was just a little hole in one of the woods in the window. And we used to take turns. Who's going to look at the sky or at the light of the day? So among all the people that were down there, everybody got a chance to walk up to this hole and look. And I remember my aunt letting us go and saying, I want you to every day look at the light of day. And through this little hole, I saw the light of day. And today, when I see the light of day, and I see people walking and running and doing things, and then don't stop to look at the light of day. They do things, and, and they don't realize that the whole purpose is to really enjoy the light of day that you live and you're out and you're free and they're really missing out a lot. The children that you, the four of you down in this place, what did you do all day? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Just sit all day long. Nothing. The highlight of the day was when the Nazis came and brought us the bread, which was three times a day, and the soup. When they came and started screaming and yelling that we need to stand in line, half the time we would cry because we were so scared. Most of the time we were just afraid to move because who's looking through the hole, and maybe we're doing something that will get them angry. If we, if we sit, maybe they'll be angry. If we stand, maybe they'll be angry. Maybe they'll come and take us and kill us. So it was uh, all the time afraid. When you stood in line, did you do it indoors or outdoors? Outdoors. They would take us outdoors, uh, quickly count us up, get us back indoors. And after a while, they would not take us outdoors. They would just do it indoors, downstairs. And the only highlight of our lives was when Carly came with his German Shepherd. He let us caress his dog. He talked to us, and he said, don't be afraid and I'll bring you something to eat. And that was the highlight of our life in the Grey House. How many people were in this room? Maybe 30. But all the time they were taking out people. And at the end, at the end, before they took us away from there, maybe for a week, it was just the two aunts and the four children. Why do you think you were the last ones? I don't know. It's just like today, whoever meets me and asks me where we're during the war, and I say I was in the concentration camp, they say, were you a little child? And I say yes, and they say, how, how come that you survived? How, how is that possible? And being a religious person, Having faith, I believe that it was a miracle and an act of God, nothing else. Did you pray? All the time, place? all the time, all the time. That, that one little prayer that I knew 
אשמע ישראל, אדושם אלוקינו, אדושם אחד. Meaning, you know, our God is one, and our God is our God. And I had such faith that maybe it's going to be all right. Did the rest of the children know this prayer? Yes. Yes. Where did they take you from here? From here they took us to a place called Breslau. And in Breslau it was not a, it wasn't a, a concentration camp. It was more like houses, houses built from, from, you know, like houses are built, not wood, but maybe cement. And uh, there I saw my uncle again, and they brought their, the men and the women. And I remember the most heartbreaking goodbye that I have ever seen was the goodbye that my aunt and uncle said to each other in Breslau. Because uh, I think that they realized that this is for real and they're not going to go home, that they're going to be taken somewhere and maybe they'll never see each other again. And what I forgot to tell you about um, Vielichka is that my father's brother lived in Vielichka and he had three daughters. One was my age, um, which at, so at the time she was six, and one was 12, and one was 17. And the name was, the youngest one was um, Gija, Lola, and Bella. And they were stunning. They were so beautiful that I think today if they were uh, taken uh, to a contest, they would win a beauty contest. They were really magnificent looking girls. And uh, my uncle, my father's brother, was very much concerned that if the Nazis caught these girls, that they might use them sexually. So he made arrangement with some kind of a peasant from Wielichka, a Polish peasant, to take them over the border to some other country. And my uncle gave uh, all his savings that he had and asked this peasant that if he does that, and after the war, he will get more money. So the peasant went, and uh, he came back three days later, and he came to my uncle in the house where the other uncle lived, this uncle Max Katz, and this uncle's name was Yisrael Landau, and he also called himself Isaac Landau, and he said to him, I'm really sorry, but when we got to the border, the Nazis took your girls, and I don't even want to tell you what happened to them. And I remember my uncle started screaming and pulling his hair, and just, he almost went crazy. So that, that were my first cousins, three of my first cousins. So, so now we are Breslau. In, in Breslau, right? So now the, the aunt and the uncle said goodbye to each other, and they took all the men away, and they took everybody's uh, whatever personal things that were still left with us. They took now everything away from us, like uh, my aunt had little earrings, like little gold dots in her ear, they took that. And my little cousin, her daughter, also had these little, you know, gold dots they used to put on little girls. They took that. And then my aunt had a little uh, wedding band, a gold wedding band. They took that. They took everything from the men. And they took all the men away. 
and then we were in Breslau and um, they told all of us to get undressed and uh, the end the mother of the boy his name uh, was Yosele Nechemiele and um, I'm sure that was like a, a maybe it was Yosef and something else but that's what they called him and his mother's um, his name her name was Gitcha and the other end was Gitcha also both ends the same had the same name and she was a daughter of a very famous rabbi and she said I'm not getting undressed and they started beating her and they said you are and she said no and they were beating her and beating her and she was screaming and crying and uh, and um, this other aunt that was the mother of my cousin she also was religious in fact, she used to wear a, a, a shaitel. She wore a wig. Both women wore wigs. And they took that away from them, which was a great shock for them because that's how they were brought up, never to uncover their hair in front of um, men. And uh, I know it was a Saturday, and I don't know how, how long after we got there, but they told us that we all have to get on trucks. And the way I know it was a Saturday is because the aunt, the mother of the little boy, she said, I don't go on trucks on Saturday because I don't ride on Saturday. And they said, well, you are getting on this truck. And again, the beating started. And uh, her little boy, he screamed and he cried and he was yelling you know mama mama and a lot of people were screaming and crying because it was a place where they were separating people to go into different camps and uh, they took my two aunts and us and they put us on these trucks and some other people and they took us to a place called Robin's Brick. And in Robin's Brick, I think this other aunt that she lost her mind. She lost her mind because she acted very, very strange. And uh, whatever they told her, she was saying, I'm not getting undressed in front of men and give me back my shaitel and I don't want to eat non-kosher food and I want to go home and give me my child and they and my other aunt took the little boy and now she was in charge of the little boy because this this aunt was really already she was she lost her mind and <laughs> and my aunt, the one that was okay, she said to me, I want you to hold this aunt's hand and whenever they tell us to go someplace you you just pull her because I have to take care of the little boy and I have to take care of this other little girl of her daughter 
and and the, and the third girl she already knew how to walk by herself because she was close to my age so I try I kept holding the, the hand of this other aunt that she, she was crazy already. <laughs> I really hope whoever sees this tape even a hundred years from today will never forgive those Nazis for what they did to us. So I, I was kind of pulling my aunt, the other aunt, and the one that was crazy. And may she rest in peace. And I was saying to her, don't cry and don't worry. You're going to get back your shaitel and you're going to get back your clothes and you're going to get your little boy. But you have to eat because if you don't eat, you're going to get hungry and you won't be able to take care of your little child. And every time the Nazis came and they would kick her and beat her and do all kinds of terrible things to her. And we went, one night we went to sleep in our barracks and she got out of her uh, bunk bed and she took her little boy and she started running to the door and she said, I'm going home and my aunt said to me go run after her and he said I said you can't go home because we don't have a home and, and she started banging on the door and, and then the Nazis came and my other aunt came and grabbed the child, the little boy, out of her arms and they took her away and we never saw her again. When they took you on the truck and your aunts didn't want to get undressed. Did they get undressed finally? And you? So... Did they give you any other clothes? No. Only in Ravensbrück, when we came, they gave us clothes with stripes. They gave us these striped dresses, and they gave us shoes, some kind of, uh, without laces, but some kind of a shoe. And they came with dogs, with a lot of dogs, and these dogs jumped on a lot of us, and a lot of people, they bit the dogs and they came with horses and they tried to run into us with the horses but the horses didn't want it's amazing the horses would not go on us they kept going ooh, you know and they kept standing up and then they took us all to some big room and uh, they shaved everybody's heads and they put numbers not on our body but on our dresses they some kind of a number in in a white there was something white on the dress 
and there was the number. Do you remember how you lived in Ravensbrück? Did you live in houses? I remember it was uh, barracks. And many, many people in the barracks. All of us infested with lice. Because I remember that uh, every night we were scratching we were getting so bitten up and my aunt would say you just have to try to bear it and she would go and get a rag with cold water and she would wet water you know whatever water there was and she would put it on us because we were so bitten up and I remember everybody having terrible diarrhea and running to the bathrooms and all the time there were these long lines the bathrooms were just like you know holes and we would stand on line and no sooner did you finish you went back on the line because you could barely make it back again to the bathroom and I remember dying people dying all the time not just from getting killed but from dying, from, from sickness, from starvation. Because after a while, we couldn't make it to the bathrooms anymore, so we just had to go outside. And to get out of our barrack, to go to find an empty space, we had to go over these dead bodies. And there were so many just bodies and bodies and bodies dead. And I also remember that in the morning, every day, they would have us go through lines. And at the head of the line, there were two lines. At the head of the line were two Nazis, or Gestapos, or whatever you call them. And they would say, to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left. And I don't remember what was to, the, to life and what was to death. But one of the lines, we never saw these people again. And one of the other lines, you again got the chance tomorrow to go again through the same thing. And uh, I remember that I got an ear infection. Terrible earaches, terrible, terrible, terrible. And pus just running down my, my head. And we were sleeping on some kind of a mattresses that were filled with hay. And my aunt taking the hay and crushing it up and sticking it in my ear and saying, you must not let that pus run down your ear because if you do, you're going to go on the line that's for death. And don't cry about it, that it hurts you. And if they ask you anything, don't say. And I remember we were going through these lines, and I was thinking, if this hurts, then how much more can death hurt? So I'm not going to say anything. And I remember a doctor in Ravensbrück. I don't know. Uh, whether he was assigned by the Germans to take care if somebody was sick or, or whether he was just what he was because there were no men there that I remember with us in our area and I remember that many many times we would say to my aunt I'm nauseous, I'm so nauseous, I'm not so nauseous, and my stomach hurts, and I'm so sick. And one time we met this man who said he's the doctor, and he didn't give us anything, but I don't know what it is that he, how he helped us. I just remember. And I also remember but I don't remember where it was. But I remember us going into showers. And 
This I can't remember if it was in what camp, but I know that people didn't want to go and the Nazis were pushing everybody in. And I remember my aunt saying to another woman, try not to go into the shower because sometimes it's not a shower, sometimes it's gas that will come out and we won't come out of there. And we were pushed in there. And, but I don't remember where it was. And it's very possible that I was in some other camp that I don't remember. But, and I can't remember where, but I just remember that I saw these showers and that I was thinking, what, you know, are we going to come out of this? Is this going to be water? Is this going to be gas that is going to kill us? And uh, to this day, when I see a lot of metal in bathrooms, if it's in a hotel, I always tell my husband, I, I, don't, I don't like these rooms, I don't like to be here. And, and I remember we were in Switzerland just recently, and uh, we went into a hotel, and they had so many pipes, and they were all this color of silver, you know, metal. Uh, and I said, I don't want to go into the showers. And my husband said, you have nothing to be afraid of. This is such a long time ago. And I said, I'm not, I just don't want to stay in this hotel. Were there any more children in Ravensbrück with you? Yes, there were a lot of children in Ravensbrück. OK, we will stop again. Uh, Rachel, were there any other children with you in this barrack? I think so. I think there were some other children, yes. Do you remember uh, how they behaved? Did they behave differently than you did? Everybody was very scared and very, very hungry all the time and very, very uh, petrified in a state of, of just petrified because we never knew which moment who of us is going to get taken because every morning they would take us and they would do this counting and many times they would take children and again I hope this is the camp that it happened but I know that they took children and they never brought them back and we used to hear a lot, a lot of screaming. And I don't know what was going on, whether it was that they were doing uh, te all kinds of, you know, testing or, 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 or trying to see how long somebody can suffer or what they were doing, but the screaming was just so unbearable. So imagine that you live in this perpetual state of hearing torturous screaming and crying, seeing people being shot, seeing dead bodies lying everywhere, being hungry all the time, being scared all the time. So there's, I mean, there's no way that you can act but just be scared, all the time scared. Do you remember uh, talking to your aunt, asking her about your parents? Yes. I remember asking her, when will my parents come? And she said, you'll see them, don't worry. And I, I just remember also that she was trying to be, be very brave. She was always trying to get food, you know, whatever food there was, she was trying to get it. She was going for the soup. So she was always trying to get as much as possible for, you know, all the four children. Two of us could stand on line and her daughter was in her arms, the little boy was in her arms. And so many times I remember she would get hit and many times by women. Th there was women also that were 
SS, especially in Ravensbrück. I remember, and these women used to hit my aunt and hit other women so brutally and so badly that to this day I can remember my aunt's face, you know, every time she got hit, how she looked and she couldn't understand, I mean, why? Did you ask her why? No, because I knew that she was being hurt, that it was very painful for her. Where did you go from Ravensbrück? From Ravensbrück, we went to a camp called Bergen-Belsen. And in Bergen-Belsen, we were also only women, and there were more children. In Bergen-Belsen, there were quite a few children. And I remember in Bergen-Belsen, there was very little food. And sometimes we got the three slices of bread, but most of the time only two a day or sometimes one a day. And I remember one time I saw someplace a pile of potatoes. So I tried to figure out a way, how can I get a potato? And what am, what am I going to do with this potato when I get it? And so I figured out, and I, I was always trying to be this hero for everybody and this, this happy person that everybody loves. And I wanted to make my aunt and my cousins happy, so I was trying to figure out if I'm going to take one of these potatoes, then maybe my aunt will find a way to um, cook it somehow, and then everybody will have a piece of potato. So I remember putting my hand into a certain, there was like an area where these potatoes were, and they were surrounded by some kind of a gate. And I remember putting my hand into this gate, and I remember feeling a whip slash right through my hand. And till this day, I have a scar because my finger got cut like a, quite a big part of it was hanging down and bleeding. But I took a potato and I ran. And I brought it to my aunt, and I think she found a way that there was some kind of a fire someplace that they made, you know, they made some fire outside with some twigs and she put that potato there and then she divided it five ways four children and herself and I, I remember a lot of sickness in Bergen-Belsen I remember a lot of a lot of marching a lot of a lot of trucks a lot of people coming marching where I don't know where, but I saw people marching, marching, marching. I don't know where they were marching. Do you remember what year this was, or did you know what year it Well, was? I know that I was liberated from Bergen-Belsen by the British in 1945. And I, I know that I was there quite a long time. I, I tell you, I remember a lot of walking, a lot of this counting. I remember a lot of barbed wire. I remember a lot of people running to the barbed wire, trying to run away. I remember people being counted and being taken and being told that they were going to get killed. And I remember people running from these appels, what they called, and running into the barbed wire. And they got killed anyway, and many other people got killed with them. And then I remember things got very bad, and we only got one slice of bread. And everybody got sick. And I got sick with typhus. My aunt got sick with typhus. And the two, her daughter did not get sick. And the two other children, the little boy and the little girl, 
they got sick with tuberculosis. And I remember we were lying there on the floor in these barracks, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of crying and a lot of sighing and a lot of kind of going to die. And I still remember people being taken to die. And I remember people just dying from hunger. And I remember one day the trucks came and they said they're taking all the sick people. And I took my cousins and we went under the barrack. The barrack was standing on stilts and there was there was some kind of a sand or earth or something. And we all pushed ourselves into that under the barracks because we were all so scared of these trucks. And I remember we waited and we waited and we waited and we probably fainted because I don't remember what happened for a very long time. But then I remember when we did open our eyes, we got out from this sand or whatever it was, and we went up into the barrack, and my aunt wasn't there. They took her away. And it was now just us, the four children. And now we were just so sick that we could not even function. And we were getting this bread and I suppose it was towards the end of the war and many Nazis were already fleeing themselves and there weren't that many trucks so they couldn't take so many people to kill them wherever they were taking them and I remember we were lying there and it was just you know it was a feeling that if you could describe one step before death, death. But you just didn't know who's going to kill you, the Nazis or the sickness. And I just remember saying to the children, you know what? If you keep saying Shema Israel, then maybe it's like medicine and maybe we'll get better because we don't have a grown-up now to take care of us and give us medicine. So maybe now only God is going to take care of us and maybe this is his medicine that we're going to say this prayer because um, we'll get the bread, but maybe that's not going to help us too much. And so they brought us the bread and I remember taking the bread and crumpling it up into tiny, tiny, li tiny little crumbs. And I remember when I was in Skavina, a little girl, I once saw a bird sitting in a tree and crying. And the bird was crying, crying, crying. And then I saw another bigger bird came, and in the mouth it had like little crumbs of, I don't know what it had, it was putting it in the mouth of this other bird. And so I remembered that in, in Bergen-Belsen. And I was thinking, if I have enough crumbs, maybe if I feed the children like a bird, a little, a little, a little, maybe it's going to last us for a long time. And I remember I was doing that to all these little children, I mean, my cousins. And then I don't remember anything, but what I remember is seeing a lot of soldiers at the door. And it was the, the British. And they didn't come in. They just stood at the door. And they were saying, oh my God. Oh my God, what is this? And one was kind of, I remember them at this door that even though they, they 
or were standing like maybe three in a line or more. They were kind of jumping over each other to see and they weren't coming in. And I don't know whether we were in a state of total faintness or what, but I remember they started throwing candies at us. And we, we couldn't even put out our hand to take it. And then I don't remember anything else. But then I remember after that, that I woke up, it looked like a hospital, and uh, my, uh, my cousin was next to me. She was sitting and I was lying in bed. And it was a woman in white. And I said, can I go to my mother? And she said, I don't know where your mother is. And I said, could I go to my aunt? And she said, I don't know where your aunt is. And I said, where is my cousin, my little boy cousin, my little girl? And she said, I, I have wonderful news for you. It's The war is over. And they they were, t they were taken to Sweden. All the children that had tuberculosis were taken to Sweden. And you, you, you have uh, typhus, and we're going to get you better. And your cousin is here, and she, she's okay, but she's going to stay here because we're going to take care of her and you, and together you'll go someplace. And then I remember my uncle Mordechai Katz, my uncle Max, you know, the one from the Elichka. He came, and I don't, at that time, I didn't know how he found us. But since then, I found out that the Red Cross, after the liberation, went to the men's camps and gave them lists of survivors. And my aunt was on the list of the survivors, his wife, my father's sister. And he came to me and he said, where is my aunt? And I said, they killed her because she was sick and it took her away. And I remember him slapping me and he said, don't say such terrible things. He, he said, I know she's alive. And because the Red Cross has her on the list. And I said, she's not. And so he started pulling out his hair. He had very little hair because he was shaven anyway, but he was just going and pulling his hair and scratching his face. And he said, I don't want to live. And I remember I said, you have to live. I said to him, you have to take care of us. And then I don't know what happened, but a few weeks later, I was no more in that hospital or whatever it was. I don't know if it was a hospital or makeshift hospital. And he took us, he took me and he took his other, his daughter, his only child, and he took us to Czechoslovakia. We went through Prague and we went to Czechoslovakia to his hometown where he came from originally, which was Chesky Tieshin. How old were you then? If I was born in 36, and if I went to the concentration in 42, and this was now 45, then I probably was nine years old.
Did you get in touch with the other two children? No. The other two children were in uh, Sweden. When they got better, relatives from the United States adapted them and didn't tell them that they were not their children. And uh, the little girl, she knew because she was, she was, I think, seven. So she knew. The little boy didn't know. And not the little boy and not the little girl were ever allowed to speak to me by these adopted relatives. They t denied the whole story as though it never happened. Uh, on the day of the boy's bar mitzvah, way before, I called these little children. I mean, they weren't little anymore. When we got all big already in our 20s, I called. Uh, and I asked to speak to them. Actually, no, no it wasn't in our 20s. It was in a, a teen years. And I asked to speak to them. and. The, the relatives that adopted them said, I'm asking you, please do us a favor and don't call us. We want them to forget about it and we don't want them to know. So I said, can you ask them to speak to me and could, could they tell me that? And they said, no, we don't, we don't want them to even think about it. And then when the boy had a bar mitzvah, his, he came to a bar mitzvah age, when he was 13, this family went with him to the rabbi to learn, for prepare for the bar mitzvah. And the rabbi said that this boy, when, once his bar mitzvah, he should say Kaddish for his parents, because his parents deserve that their son should say Kaddish for them. And so they told the boy, and the boy had a nervous breakdown. And for years he was under psychiatrist care. Now he's fine. Now he's a father and he has children, but he doesn't want to talk about it and he doesn't want to be reminded and he doesn't want to, he just wants to live today and not to look into the past. And the girl? And the girl, she got married. She had children, and she had a nervous breakdown too. And uh, she recovered, and now she's fine. The daughter of my uncle and my aunt, she is fine. She's strong. She's fine. She has children and grandchildren. She doesn't want to talk about it. And then it's me. When you came back to Czechoslovakia, did you stay together with your cousin and your yes, uncle? Yes, I stayed together with my cousin and my uncle. My uncle uh, took in again everybody who passed through Czechoslovakia on their way to Israel or to America. They stayed in his apartment. They ate. Everybody knew that Mordechai Katz is back in Czechoslovakia and that we can come to his home and we can be taken care of till we go on. And my cousin and I were there. We lived with my uncle. We went to school in Czechoslovakia. And uh, My uncle got married. He married a cousin of his who lost her husband and who lost her child. And they got married and they had three children together. Do you remember what language your parents spoke at home? Polish and Yiddish. And what did you speak after that in the camps? Polish and German. And, and Yiddish. 
When you came to Czechoslovakia, what uh, language school did you go to? Czech. So I learned how to speak Czech. So then I spoke Polish, Yiddish, German, and Czech. Uh, how long did you uh, go to school? In Czechoslovakia, I was for two years, and I went to school there. And then the aunt that married my uncle, then by, by that time they had one child, and plus my cousin who survived the camp. And uh, she said to my uncle, look, I'm in my early 20s, I have a child, and I have your child. Why don't you take Rachel and send her? Sh two brothers of her father survived. They live in Belgium. Why don't you send her to her father's brother? And so he sent my uncle reluctantly because he didn't want to, but you know, he had to start a new life. So he sent me to Belgium. And I lived in Belgium for one year and I went to school in Belgium. Did you know that these uncles exist, your father's brother? Um, yes, I did because they came to Czechoslovakia, passing through to go to Belgium. So one uncle, the older one, lost his wife and the three daughters. The second uncle lost his wife and one daughter. And he had one daughter and he remarried. The uncle that lost his wife and three daughters remarried. And they moved going through Czechoslovakia to Belgium. I saw them. But my uncle from Czechoslovakia didn't want to give me up to them. He wanted to bring me up at his, as his child. But now his wife, you know, wanted me to go and live with uh, the other uncles. So I went and I lived in Belgium and now I l learned French and I went to French school. Did you know these uncles before? No. No. So I went to live with my uncle in Belgium who married the most wonderful, wonderful woman who survived Auschwitz with one son and uh, she was a very strong influence in my life. She actually taught me how to how to be a lady, how to be a a nice person. Her name is Basha Landau. Blanche. They called her Blanche in Belgium and in America. When did you finally realize that your parents are not coming back? I still didn't realize it till today. Maybe it's hard for you to believe, but if not for age that I know that maybe by now they would be very old, I never accepted it that they're not going to come back, and I still don't. You grew up in Belgium? No, after Bel I was in Belgium, and I remembered that my parents at home always spoke about Israel, which at that time they said Palestine, because Palestine was the Jewish people's homeland, and Zionism. They spoke Zion, Zion. And I thought to myself, if my parents died for no reason, let there be a reason to their death, and let their child survive and go on to live in this land of Palestine, which was by then Israel, and let me become an Israeli citizen and live there and be part of, of what the Jewish people are going to be. So in 49, I left Belgium with Youth Aliyah, 
which is the youth movement, you know. And I went to Israel, and I lived in Israel. I went to school in Israel. I went to the Israeli army, and I became an Israeli citizen. So you had to learn another language? Another language, Hebrew. How many languages do you speak today? Today I speak uh, Polish, Yiddish, German, I forgot Czech, French, English, and Hebrew. We're going to stop a minute. Well, you went to Israel. Did you go to school? Yes. I went to, uh, with Youth Aliyah to a school where I lived. It was an agricultural school called Kfar Hanoar Hadati. Uh, and there we studied half a day, and half a day we worked. Was it like a kibbutz, or? Um, no, it was not a kibbutz. It was, it was a school from Youth Aliyah, where they brought in all these children from, from Europe that uh, had no parents and no home to go to. Did you meet here any other children that went through similar experiences that you did? No, because I want to tell you, as soon as I came to Israel, as soon as I came to this Youth Aliyah school, everybody asked me, where are you from? Where are you born? I said, I'm a Sabra. I did not want to talk about it. I didn't want to admit that I was there. And I didn't want to be part of the people that this happened to. And I admired the Sabras, the Israeli-born young people, and I admired the Israeli people in general because they were so brave, because they had an army, because they had guns, because they had planes. And I could not understand or did not want to be part of people that I was part of, that, that this happened to, and that nobody helped us to f defend ourselves. So not to have to cope with it, I totally denied it. And didn't want to, to be at all, at all associated with people that went through this. Were you ashamed? Yes, I was ashamed. Explain that. Uh, I, I was ashamed to be part of a society that could allow something like that to happen. I was ashamed of humanity for allowing men to do such terrible things to men. And I did not want to, to believe that there was such a humanity, that there was such a world so I didn't want to, to say that it was. And I felt if I said that it wasn't, then maybe it wasn't. So for years and years and years, I did not ever say that I'm a Holocaust survivor. How long did you stay in Israel? Seven years. What did you do in Israel? First, I went to uh, this school called Kfar Hanor Hadati, where I got part of my elementary school education, the latter part. Then I went to a school called Mikve Israel, which was my high school education. This was a high school, also an agricultural youth aliyah school. And after that, I went to the army, where I served for two years. When you came to Israel, did you know how to read or write? I knew how to read uh, French, and I knew how to read uh, Czech and write Czech. I knew how to um, read Hebrew because of the prayers that my uncle taught us in Czechoslovakia how to uh, pray. So that is Hebrew. So that's how I knew that. And also because in Belgium, I went to something called uh, Sunday school. 
when you came out of the Israeli army, what were your plans? I had no plans. It was, it was a, a cultural shock because it was for the first time in my life that I was by myself. And I said to myself, what now? Where do I go from here? The army is wonderful, but you, you, you know, don't study a profession. So I, when I was in the army, I was the secretary to the director of the hospital. But uh, I was more of a public relations person rather than a secretary, because I didn't know how to type. I didn't know how to take steno. So I came out of the army ready to be a public relations person without education, you know, for, for such a profession. So um, I got myself different jobs, and my uncle, the one who lived in Belgium, since then moved to the United States gave me a present, a ticket to the United States, and money for a college education. So I came to America, and I went to college. Where? In New York, Yeshiva University, Stern College for Women. And then I met my first husband, and I had two beautiful daughters. One is Miriam, and one is Michelle. How did you meet your first husband? Um, my first husband I met in the summer of my, um, my college. All the students went to work in the Catskill Mountains of New York State in hotels as counselors or as waiters. So um, I came to work there as a counselor, and my husband was there working also, and that's how we met. And then 23 years later, we got divorced, and I moved back to Israel. And um, two years after I lived in Israel, I met Barney. He came. Let's wait with Barney for a minute. Uh, your daughters, they were born? They were born in the United States, and they went to school in the United States. When you went back to Israel? My daughters came, and they studied at Bar Ilan University in Israel. They went with me. And then when did you come back here? I came back in 85. 1985. You met your present husband? In Israel, and in Jerusalem. And when you came back to the United States, did your children come with you? No, they stayed because they since married. And uh, they, they came for a while. Uh, my oldest daughter lived in Houston, Texas, where she studied and received her master's degree in physical education, no, um, physical therapist. She's a physical therapist, What's Miriam, Miriam. And uh, my other daughter, Michelle, she married and she lived in uh, Los Angeles. And then in 1983, I believe, they both moved back to Israel. And now they both live in Israel. They're married. Miriam is married to a wonderful young man called Mark, Mark Garson. Michelle is married to a wonderful young man called Ron Gars, um, Katz. And uh, M Miriam has three children. One is Daniela, one is Ariela, and one is Meira. And uh, Michelle has three wonderful children. Arye, named after my father, Mindy, and Yitzhak. Do you spend time with your grandchildren? Yes. I go to Israel twice a year, and I stay six weeks each time I go. When your daughters were growing up, did they know your background? 
they knew that I was a Holocaust survivor and that I couldn't talk about it, that I just, I was too emotional, I couldn't talk about it. Did they ask? They said, would you ever tell us? And I said, yes, one day I'll tell you. Um, with your first husband in your marriage, uh, how did you practice Judaism? Orthodox, modern Orthodox. Did you have a kosher home? A kosher home. We didn't, I travel on Saturday. Uh, we kept all the holidays. We went to synagogue. We didn't uh, watch TV or listen to radio on Shabbat. And your daughters? They're modern Orthodox. Um, how do you practice Judaism today? Today, it's, um, it's very interesting because Barney, my present husband, is not religious at all. But he lets me be what I am, and I don't interfere with what he does. So on Shabbat, I don't travel and I don't put on lights and I still do my thing and if he has to go somewhere and he wants to go, he goes in his car and goes, but he practices a wonderful, a wonderful way of Judaism. He's a, a great philanthropist and he helps, he helps Israel, he helps America, he just is a great humanitarian. You, what did your first husband do for a living? Uh, I'd rather not talk about my first husband, if you don't mind. Okay. And what does Barney do? Barney is a semi-retired businessman. How did you meet him? Um, I worked as an evening manager at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, and he came um, on a um, APAC mission which is uh, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And he, he was an um, officer of APAC. And uh, I was talking to friends of mine from New York, um, Louise and Mike Stein, who were APAC officers also. And they were also Barney's friends, and they were my friends. and. Um, they were talking to me and Barney passed by and he said, could you introduce me to this young lady? And they said yes and they introduced us. And then I said, excuse me, I'm in the middle of my work and I have to go to work. And Congressman, and, uh, Congressman Tom Lantos and Annette Lantos were also in Israel at the time. And they were also at the King David. And Barney, being their best friend, asked them, to to try to to be intermediary somehow so they came over to me and they said excuse us uh, we'd like to talk to you could you meet us for some drinks in the lounge so I said well I'm working now but I'm through at midnight I'll be happy to and so I met them at, in the lounge and Barney was there with them and we were talking and about five minutes later, Congressman Lantos, very seriously, as only he can be when he wants to point, prove a point, and Annette too, because she was in on it, he said, oh my goodness, I have a very important meeting to go to. And mind you, this was midnight. And so Annette said, oh yes, yes, we have to go. So they went and they left the two of us alone. And Did you know who Tom Lantos was then? I know he was a, a famous United States congressman, yes. And I knew that his wife, Annette, was also very, very active in all the right things. So did you get married in Israel? No, we got married in the United States. We got married in Alaska. How did you get here? To the United States. How did you get back? Why, why did you come back? Did you? come back to get married or did you come well, back for other reason? Barney and I dated and he came back many times to date and to, to meet and to get to know each other and then he proposed. So we both decided to try if I could live in Alaska. 
so I came to Alaska and I stayed there for one year to see if it worked and uh, it did so we got married how long after you met him did you get married um, we met in 85 and we got married in 86 one year do you still live in Alaska yes I live in Alaska part-time and I live part-time in um, Hawaii and uh, I live three months in Israel we have an apartment in Israel if you had a chance to tell the children of the future anything that's very important to you what would you say to them I would say be very tolerant because tolerance will not bring about hate of one religion to another or one race or one color tolerance can only bring love and if there's love and tolerance then there cannot be any such terrible atrocities that we saw then and I would tell them just to try to have hope no matter what happens and no matter in what terrible situation you are don't give in and don't despair have hope because at the end of every horrible black tunnel there is a beautiful rainbow I want to thank you I want to thank you I want to thank you camera lady and cameraman for making it possible so the future generations can know what happened to us. Thank you very much. Rachel, would you introduce your husband to us? My pleasure. This is my husband, Barnard J. Gatstein, who we call Short Barney. Short uh, Barney? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married? We've been married 10 years. We have, uh, we got married July 2nd, 1986. Where? In Anchorage, Alaska. And you live where? We live in Anchorage, Alaska, and in Maui, Hawaii, and uh, three months out of the year in Herzliya Pituach in Israel. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, when you married Rachel, did you know that she was a Holocaust survivor? Of course, sure. In fact, uh, we went together to Yad Vashem for the first time she had seen Yad Vashem. It was, uh, Who instigated it? APAC. APAC had a tour to Yad Vashem and I said I don't want to go and my husband said uh, if I go would you like to try? Do you have any children? Uh, yes, I have five children. And they live where? Four of them live in Alaska and one in Connecticut. Is there anything uh you would like to tell us about Rachel? Well, there are many things I could tell about Rachel. She's a very, very amazing person that after all of the things she went through that she came out with the gentleness and the kindness and the spirit that she has, which would be unusual in somebody that hadn't gone through what she went through. Rachel, how about you? Is there anything you would like to tell Barney at the to present time? To say about time? Barney? To just tell you about Barney? Well, um, I think after you go through an experience like I went through, uh, every day of your life that you live should be very meaningful and should be with a very meaningful person 
And um, Barney is a, a very, very special person in that that uh, he does so much for humanity. He does it for uh, the Christian world, the Jewish world. He even, uh, I mean, not even, but he wants to do for the Muslim world. He just wants to help humanity. And for me, this is uh, regaining my faith faith in humanity when I see how much a person does. So uh, I'm just to totally in awe of all the things that Barney does and uh, I'm so happy and lucky that I met such a person. I just meant to ask you, how is your relationship with God? My relationship with God is very good. I hope his relationship with me is as good as mine with him. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both. Thank you very much.